Good morning and thanks for joining us today. As you know, over the past year, the incredible and spectacular double bottom line that the Ontario Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries represent received a triple threat. We were in the midst of a global pandemic with a healthcare crisis, an economic crisis which quickly ensued, and of course, a social crisis which created uh, some unique challenges for the sectors that I represent, particularly for sports. That's why we're here today. Over the past two weeks, this ministry has been able to invest over $364 million in additional funding for our hardest hit sectors. This includes $62 million for our iconic institutions, $25 million for our core cultural institutions and our artists, $105 million yesterday for community building, which includes a $50 million investment into sports and recreation, $2.7 million for our provincial sport organizations, $2.5 million for music, and $2 million for the museum. This is on top, of course, of the $150 million travel incentive that we will be rolling out with the Ministry of Finance. Our sectors, as I mentioned, have been hit first hardest and will take the longest to recover. On March the 12th, that was the day the game stopped. I will re remember it forever. My daughter Victoria was turning 15, and as the sports minister, I had to uh, inform her that her hockey tournament in Toronto would be cancelled. Sport is a very important part of our cultural fabric as Ontarians. It makes us cheer. It's indelible in all of the uh, all of the different opportunities that we have in our local community to build up young athletes, bring parents and friends and neighbours together, and it gives us a sense of pride at the national level. Sport in Ontario also is big business. It represents $12.6 billion in economic activity. And for us to recover, we're going to have to look at both our investments as strategic for our cultural fabric, but also for our economic recovery. And that's why it's important for us to have an eye on a playground to podium approach, while at the same time looking at making sure that sports tourism and sports businesses are viable post-pandemic. In the early days of the pandemic, I created two ministerial advisory committees that helped guide our reopenings for major league sports and their professional teams, as well as our amateur athletes. And I'll have a little bit more to say today. But it's important for us to invest the, at this time for our provincial sport organizations at the grassroots level, while at the same time continuing to support our high performance and professional and Olympic athletes. Today's announcement is to set our athletes up for success, to ensure that they have a safe return to play with respect to COVID-19, but also in the longer frame, looking at their physical safety and their mental health uh, after COVID-19. Key to all of this will be for all of us in Ontario to restore confidence, which we know has been quite difficult during this pandemic. Today's announcement specifically is $15.3 million to support four initiatives. The first is $3 million in 2020 to 2021 for Sport for Ontario. They will deliver a pilot program that helps kids and families regain confidence in sport and recreation activities. The program will allow support grassroots physical activity and recreational programming. It will promote mental wellness and safety in sport that is free from harassment, abuse and discrimination. What's really exciting about this project is we will leverage our strong relationships with our professional sport organizations, their charitable foundations, and the Canadian Olympic Committee as we cheer on our athletes in Tokyo. In addition, we will be providing an additional $3.6 million for 43, sorry, for 63 recognized provincial sport organizations to support their member community sport clubs who provide access to sports such as soccer, volleyball, skiing, etc. A portion of this funding will support their administrative costs, with the remainder being used to support member clubs across the province of Ontario. We are excited to continue to support our high-performance athletes, and that's why we will be contributing $6.36 million for Quest for Gold Canada to support approximately 550 Ontario athletes who have reached national competition level as part of Quest for Gold's Canada Card program. This initiative provides direct financial assistance to high-performance athletes, enhancing their ability to train by reducing the financial burden. This amount represents a one-time increase of $8,400 for national-level athletes. And let me tell you, it has had great success since this program was established in 2006, seeing our Olympic athletes 
uh, from Ontario has increased uh, uh, threefold um, over that period of time and we're excited to continue to work with the Canadian Olympic Committee and the Canadian Sport Institute of Ontario to make sure our, our high performance athletes like Penny Alexiak, uh, like Andre de Gas, and so many others can continue to uh, top podiums around the world, particularly at the Olympics. And finally, we know that this has been a very tough year on our OHL athletes and hockey athletes uh, in particular. We are going today to invest $2.35 million to the Ontario Hockey League post-secondary education scholarship for athletes on 17 Ontario-based teams. This investment provides approximately $138,000 to each of the 17 teams to help them meet their player scholarship commitments. This is an initial investment. As we are continuing to work with the OHL on a return to play protocol uh, and a safe return to play, um, so those costs are still being considered and we continue to work with the OHL and I spoke yesterday with David Branch uh, to see how we can best achieve this. This is going to be a very important year for sport. As I said, we are going to be sending uh, athletes from Ontario to the Olympics, but it will culminate in the 2022 Canada Games that are going to be held in Niagara. Sport will be very important as we recover both socially and economically in the province of Ontario. I'm happy to take any questions uh, to talk about the pride of place and the pride of people that we have in Ontario's sport community. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to turn it over to a few special guests that have joined us by video. Hello, I'm Michelle O'Keefe, Chair of Sport for Ontario. On behalf Hello, I'm Michelle O'Keefe, Chair of Sport for Ontario. On behalf of Sport for Ontario, I would like to thank Minister McLeod and the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries for this funding investment and your continued support of our organization. Sport for Ontario believes in the power of sport in strengthening the sport community. That is why we are excited for this opportunity. I am joined today by colleagues and directors of Sport for Ontario, Debbie Lowe and Cyril Leader, who are excited to share our vision. Debbie? Thanks, Michelle. This is such exciting news. A return to sport at all levels of play is critical, and so too is making sure sport is a safe and inclusive environment for all, free of harassment, discrimination, and abuse. A return to sport also means the continued promotion and adherence of Rowan's Law. Another area to highlight is Sport for Ontario's commitment to mental health and advocacy and initiatives through sport and recreation. Now over to Cyril. Thanks, Debbie. Through this wonderful initiative, Sport for Ontario will have the ability to work with existing nonprofit organizations and charitable sports foundations in Ontario, including those affiliated with our professional sport franchises. Amplifying our reach will allow us to increase accessible sport and recreation programming for more children and families in Ontario. This will include inclusive virtual and in-person sport and recreation opportunities for Ontarians of all levels and abilities, truly leveraging the power of sport. Thank you, Debbie and Cyril. Thank you to the Minister and the Ministry for your confidence. We look forward to working with the sport community to get Ontario moving and back to sport. Uh, thanks very much. I'm happy to take any questions. As you can see, I'm proudly wearing my Nepean Wildcats jacket. Uh, that's the organization my daughter plays for, and I've had the privilege and opportunity over a number of years to be a trainer and, uh, and a den mom. So uh, over to you, Derek, uh, to the phone lines. Thank you. We'll take questions, sir, from the telephone lines. First question, please. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, should you have any questions, please press star one. Your first question comes from Brian Lilly with the Toronto Sun. Please go ahead. Hi, Brian. Uh, hi, Minister. Uh, interesting announcement, but what I don't see is when kids can return to play. Uh, depending on where you are in the province, it's vastly different due to the color-coded system here in Toronto and Peel. Uh, they can't even train at the moment. In red zones, it's maybe 10 kids. So for kids like your daughter who do want to get back on the ice, who are hoping for a, uh, a return to baseball, football, or soccer this summer, do you think, based on all the evidence and the, the positive benefits, that it's time for Ontario to start looking at what other provinces have done to allow youth sport to continue? 
Uh, thanks, Brian. I, I can say in, in Ottawa, uh, where I represent uh, and live, uh, my daughter has been playing uh, hockey uh, for the past a number of months, uh, with the exception of when we were in lockdown. Um, we, we have been working with our 63 provincial sport organizations on those return to play protocols. So you're welcome to go to the Ontario.ca website. We have a, a, a dedicated page on what those reopening plans are. Um, th and th that work was done early on in the pandemic, thanks to the work of my ministerial advisory committee that was led by Cyril Leader, uh, who we just heard from. So we'll continue to uh, look at what the local conditions are. Obviously we do want a healthy and safe return to play, but when you're looking at some of the modeling and uh, the, the two issues that come to mind that, that concern me as a mother, um, one is uh, these events sometimes become a super spreader event and we've seen that happen in the, in the City of Ottawa. The second issue that the Chief Medical Officer of Health has raised with me repeatedly over the past year, if uh, one of these young athletes does uh, get COVID-19 at a super spreader event, particularly particularly if they're a high performance athlete or they have an opportunity to, to play at a professional level, the respiratory uh, challenges that the young athlete may have further on uh, could uh, prohibit their uh, professional or high performance career. So we don't take these decisions lightly. We are guided always by the Chief Medical Officer of Health and our public health units. And we continue to work directly with the sector on those, uh, those important return to play protocols. I know that's probably not the answer that you wanted, um, but it's something that we, we spend a a lot of time on within the ministry and I must say um, my, my staff have worked around the clock uh, throughout this pandemic uh, in sport in particular uh, because of the regulations uh, that that and, and the process that that takes so I'm happy to take a follow-up Brian follow-up yeah. uh, on a different topic you you mentioned where you represent Nepean uh, there was a liberal candidate to set to go up against you he has strangely resigned I know it's a different party uh, but these sorts of things are are odd. They're uh, they don't happen often. Someone resigning ten days after they get the nomination. Uh, do you know anything about what's going on in in your community, uh, even though it is another party? Obviously, I heard the, the rumors and the speculation over the past number of days, and it certainly has uh, created some controversy in, in my community, uh, particularly among the South Asian community. Um, I don't normally intervene in family uh, feuds, but uh, this does have to do with my constituency of Nepean, where I've uh, represented uh, them for 15 years over five uh, mandates. Um, so obviously, I'm disturbed that Stephen Del Duca's um, Liberal Party either didn't properly vet a candidate or even worse is overturning a democratically chosen uh, candidate. Um, Nepean's not a banana republic. Uh, perhaps that's the way Stephen Del Duca runs the Liberal Party. But I, I think that uh, it's unfortunate that uh, downtown Toronto elites can run roughshod over the people that I represent, even if they happen to be in different political parties. And Brian, you used to live in Ottawa, so you know that uh, many of the candidates that I faced off in the past have become lifelong friends of mine. You know, Jack Rupal, um, you know, Laurel Gibbons, many of them whom uh, I have great respect for and uh, who uh, have uh, uh, put their community first, as I have uh, over this past number of years. So obviously, um, you know, this is not a good news story for them. And we'll just wait and see uh, what, what, if, what level of transparency they'll provide to, uh, to uh, my constituents. Thank you. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Chris Rishoe with the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hey, Chris. Hi there. Hi, Minister. Thanks for taking my questions. I was just wondering, last week you were quite optimistic about the OHL returning soon, and I'm just wondering, with the increase in the variant and reports, you know, that we're in a third wave, if that's going to impact it at all. Well, I, I don't think so, I, because I think we're, when you're working with a league uh, like the OHL or the AHL or the NHL, uh, and you really look at what a bubble will look like or if there is a hub, you take every necessary precaution. And we've been quite successful at the AHL and the NHL level, um, preventing the spread of COVID-19 and it even entering the bubble. So these are conversations. So we want to make sure that um, once we sign off on that return to play, that it's, uh, it, the integrity of that bubble uh, will will prevent uh, the spread of COVID-19 or any of the variants of concern. And so that work, again, is ongoing. And I just want to reiterate to uh, what Brian had said earlier, you know, about the return to play. And, and my concern is, and this is something I've spoken with the Chief Medical Officer of Health about, is I don't want um, a, an athlete to go into a bubble that's been infected, create a super spreader event, and then have the next Olympian or the next NHL superstar um, sideline probably permanently because of a respiratory uh, disease that uh, has been long-lasting. So uh, we do have a great deal of concern here, but I think 
if we get to the point where we've got the chief medical officer of uh, health signing off, then we will have an ironclad um, bubble that will pr protect the athletes and allow them to get a season in. Follow up. Thanks. And can you talk a little bit about what went into the decision to allow contact in the OHL and what will be allowed given the ongoing threat of COVID? Okay, well, good question. So right now, contact uh, in any sport outside of our professional sports organizations uh, is prohibited. Um, so we would need to get to the Chief Medical Officer of Health to sign off on contact given the integrity of that bubble. So to, as to, to Brian's earlier point, those protocols at the amateur level and the minor sports level have been worked on by our provincial sport organizations. They're publicly made available. They have been for quite some time. Um, but when it comes to uh, a specialized league, for example, um, you know, the Canadian Elite Basketball League, the Ontario Hockey League, uh, if they were to resume any type of contact, um, that would be signed off on their proposals. And just to give you a sense, when we signed off on the AHL and the NHL, their, their proposals were 600 pages long, rigorous testing, um, rigorous sanitation standards, um, rigorous um, protocols in place for uh, the teams and the administration and where that were in fact uh, they were able to sit that sort of thing so a lot of detail goes into this planning in order for us to make sure that the uh, the, the, the uh, athletes themselves uh, will will be safe and that we can make sure that there's no long-lasting impact on their physical uh, health um, post COVID-19. Thank you next question please. Your next question comes from Bob Belasinko with CTV. Please go ahead. Hi, Bob. Hi there, Minister. Uh, nice to uh, hear the announcement today. Good job. Thanks. Uh, curious. Uh, not to be the dead horse, but Eric? how close are we? How close? Sorry. How close? How close are we to the OHL returning? Yeah, I think uh, you know if we can if we can land something, I'm optimistic by the end of the, this month that we'll be able to make an announcement and uh, that they can get to work on selecting the locations or venues in which they will play. Um, I'll leave uh, you know once we've got the sign off, I'll leave the uh, and the protocols in place. I'll leave the, the planning on when uh, the season resumes to David Branch and his team. I had a great conversation with him yesterday. Um, we're all working very hard to make this happen. We know that um, we, we know we've got some really great uh, OHL players that are going to make a real difference in the game of hockey um, in years to come. So, but we want to make sure that we do that safe so that uh, we don't have an impact on their, on their physical health. Follow up. Uh, yeah, just changing topics here. Uh, talking about the high performance athletes, I know that uh, some in this area from Windsor have left the province to go train uh, just because of the restrictions. So just curious in terms of the money, will they be compensated, I guess, for having made the move to a different province to train? Yeah, that's interesting. We were one of the first jurisdictions in North America actually to open up for high performance training with the Canadian Sport Institute of Ontario. Uh, we were the beneficiaries obviously of having an NBA team um, with the Toronto Raptors and so so much of the work that we were able to accomplish was started and led by uh, the NBA and we were able to adopt many of their practices so that supported our uh, efforts with uh, with that. Uh, the funding today is is for the 550 athletes who've reached the national competition level so that uh, that compensation will be dedicated toward them, uh, many of whom will, will, will go to the Olympics and support us. So we want to make sure that there is funding over and above the federal funding that they, they, uh, they have. I, I just want to say, looking at the stats over the years, when you're looking at this particular program, Quest for Gold, the value for money has been absolutely incredible because you're directly investing into the athletes. And those athletes, through their high performance, are able to achieve amazing things. And again, th through the statistics that we've seen over, since this program was started in 2006, I believe, the, the same year I was first elected to this chamber, uh, we have seen our, our Olympic athletes just absolutely grow from this province. And there's a higher percentage of Ontario athletes on the Canadian Olympic team now uh, as a result of these investments from this government. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Crystal Ramlakin with CBC Ottawa. Please go ahead. Hi, Chris. Hi, Minister. Thanks for uh, taking my question. I'm just wondering how this funding and these projects will impact Ottawa locally. Do you have any details on people who might be benefiting here in Ottawa? Well, obviously, um, some of our athletes that play for the Ottawa 67s will benefit from the scholarship program, and I'm sure Mark Gowdy and uh, those at the OSAG would be able to break that down for you. I know this $3 million program, Sport for Ontario, which will be led by the former president and CEO of the Ottawa Senators, Cyril Leader, uh, will obviously have a tremendous impact in a couple of the areas that we're looking at. Obviously, as we move into the Canada 2022 Games, uh, which will be hosted in Niagara Falls, we want to make sure our athletes um, are the safest in the 
country. Uh, we also want to make sure that their mental well-being will. So uh, from the very organic level, the grassroots level, like at an Apian Wildcats level, this the, the work that they're going to be do, doing will help regain and restore trust and confidence in sport post-COVID, but also plan us out for a more successful sport year. Uh, with respect to uh, the, the quest for gold, I know personally in my constituency there's always about anywhere between three to ten athletes that qualify and that we celebrate. So uh, we, we could get you a list on who will qualify uh, this year. And uh, with the provincial sport organizations, this is absolutely incredibly important. This allows us to retain the structure and the bones of the administration of, of all of those different organizations, whether that's the Ontario Hockey Federation, um, Soccer Ontario, uh, Basketball Ontario, Ontario, uh, you name it. And so uh, at a very uh, high level, uh, making sure that uh, the, the policy work, the, the work for uh, return to play, the, the safety standards, um, how we register all of that, uh, that will impact all of our local athletes. Follow up. I'm just wondering, has all this money already been allocated for or can people still apply for it? Uh, no, so the three million dollars has obviously been allocated to sport for Ontario. Um, the three point six million for the provincial sport organizations. There is flexibility for them to support uh, some of their leagues, um, so that won't has not not all of it has been spoken for. Um, the the quest for gold money that's six point three six million dollars obviously is uh, allocated to those high performance athletes who qualify, and then the two point three five million dollars uh, will be going to the OHL, and they will distribute it based on their leagues. So this. This is all brand new money um, over, as I mentioned at the very beginning, at the, at the beginning of uh, uh, the press conference, um, this, this ministry saw an allocation increase uh, in the last year of $364 million in order to uh, support our hardest hit sectors. And that's, you know, hardest hit in heritage when you're looking at your museum closers, um, culture when you're looking at your galleries closed and, and uh, film and television production ceasing, live music stopping, um, tourism which has grinded to a halt and we've had a very difficult year. And then, of course, here in sport, making sure that we can continue to uh, not only flow the money that we already had, uh, which is about a $35 million budget, but also increasing it um, um, between this announcement and one that we previously had. Um, we're at about $18 million increase in sport uh, right now. Thank you. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Justin Dunk with CHCHTV. Please go ahead. Hi, Justin. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for taking my questions. First, the OHL is largely driven in terms of its business model around fans coming to games. Has there been any talks with the OHL around that? The Edmonton Oilers have applied for fans to come out in a limited capacity in Edmonton with the Alberta Health Services. Has there been any dialogue with the OHL about that? And is that something you could see in 2021? Uh, so that will be, I think, ruled off the table uh you know, in the immediate term. Uh, we have had conversations with the Senators and the Leafs, uh, you know, even this week about what a return would look like. I know MLSC is very excited about uh, receiving their stamp of safety, but at this point in time, at, that's not been cleared for, by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. So when we, when we talk to the OHL um, about their operations, uh, you know, what I foresee in, in order for them to get a, a, a you know, season in um, is some additional financial support from us, but, but we're still too early in the game to assess what that actually is until we actually have the finer points um, uh, dealt with in the uh, in the uh, return to play protocols. Follow up. And is there sort of a ballpark number that you think it will take to get the OHL back on the ice in terms of the commitment that you need to make? I know you sort of alluded to it, but. Is there a ballpark number and what are some of those finer points you just mentioned? Yeah, I think, look, uh, I, I think it's far too early to speculate. Um, you know, we, we understand what a hub model for the NHL is, but I don't think we're looking at that type of, uh, you know, grouping that we had and we know that that cost I think 40 million dollars so I don't think we're looking at something that's steady or steep um, but it will really uh, it will really uh, rely on the fact of the chief medical officer of health's comfort of selecting uh, w whether it's one bubble or multiple hubs what the comfort level is of um, of the the uh, OHL going out and and, and applying that. Uh, so and then how many if they do have hub cities? How many will 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 there be? Would there be municipal support? Would there be other financial support for corporations in their communities? Um, so there's so many. This is very complex uh, in order for us to to make this work. And so again, far too early to speculate. But just giving you a sense of the complexity here, um, you know, we have to look. At 
at sanitation costs, rapid testing costs, uh, what, what, what it's going to cost for officials. So this, these are all the things that, uh, that we are looking at at the same time, uh, making sure that any protocol we have um, best reflects the safety standards that we're going to require for those athletes to get back on the ice. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Josh Brown with Waterloo Region Record. Please go ahead. Hi, Josh. Hi, Lisa. I, most of my questions have been answered, but I just wanted to get some clarification on the mention that uh, when it comes to the OHL with additional further funding coming, when will that come and what will that entail? Yeah, again, we're still continuing to work on the details um, and to see what level of support they may receive from other areas, and uh, and we'll have a conversation. Um, but that is also a lengthy process uh, that that requires um, that requires going back to Treasury Board, and it requires uh, cabinet approval and all those sorts of things. So I think we're probably a couple of weeks out before we we, we get to that point. But you'll be the first to know. Follow up. Josh, do you have a follow-up? No, I'm good. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. Josh. Your next question comes from Dan Ralph with the Hi. Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, Dan. Uh, good morning, Lisa. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you if uh, where the province is in return in regards to uh, the CFL's return to play, and uh, I know that they've they've submitted that to government, but uh, can you give an update as to where that might be? Yeah, I, I, I haven't uh, spoken with Randy in a bit. Um, I have spoken with the Red Blacks uh, just last week. I speak with Mark Gowdy uh, quite frequently, obviously, because uh, they they are from my city, but they you know they have, they have so many teams uh, with the OSEG, with the 67s, and of course Red Blacks. So I know that they're they're committed to a return. What that looks like again, um, if they're going to a hub uh, model, uh, it has been undefined at this point in time, at least uh, in, on my shop. We we know early uh, in the pandemic when we thought we might might have gotten last summer in there was speculation that there would be a hub city um, so so I, I'll continue to work with Randy and others and if, if they want to play in their own st uh, stadiums um, what that would entail uh, in terms of a Canadian bubble but um, again I think it's far too early to say but we fully support the return of the CFL and I'll tell you um, I was looking forward as minister and getting down to Hamilton to support the Grey Cup and talk about the epitome of this ministry heritage sport tourism and culture you look at the Grey Cup it is uh, it's historic um, it is a sport. It's it's a, it's a driver for tourism, and of course the culture that comes with it, with the Canadian acts that uh, that uh, participate in the halftime show. And I know I'll never forget uh, being able to watch uh, in my city in Ottawa um, when we hosted the Grey Cup, Shania Twain at the halftime show. So again, um, really hopeful that we can work to a solution for them. Follow up. Follow. I mean, it's, we're now in in March. They want to start playing, get to training camp in in. In May, is that a doable timeline given where we are right now? Well, you know what? I, it, again, we continue. Every single day in COVID nineteen is a different day, um, and uh, as much as people say it's like doing the same thing over again, you don't know where the health conditions are at that moment. And so, um, you know, we could say well, we're optimistic for this to start. You know, on this date, and those dates, uh, whether it's on hockey or CFL, have, have sometimes have surpassed us. So, uh, you know, we'll continue to work with the league, and we're happy to have a great relationship with the league. And we're very proud of the three Ontario teams that we have in the league. And uh, we'll continue to monitor the situation. I wish I had the crystal ball, um, and I wish this was all over so that uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation and uh, we could see our guys uh, back on the field. But, you know, uh, we've got great partners. Um, with the Thai Cats, uh, Red Blacks, and of course the Argos, and I uh, just want to make sure that to when it's safe for them to return, that we're we're there to support them. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Raphael Gillenet with Radio Canada. Raphael, it's been a couple of days since we last spoke. Yeah, I was waiting to ask you again about the OHL. I was wondering uh, this time with the NHL draft looking to be set in late July. Uh, it's not going to be postponed. How many games are we looking at with the OHL and? Is there a possibility that there's no playoffs, just playing the regular season for the sake of playing? Uh, look, I, th I think that's far too early to say. I think the goal will be to get uh, over 20 games in if we can. Um, we're still working, as I said, through the protocols, and there is a process in place. Um, but my my hope and uh, and my aspiration here is to get that done before the draft. We recognize how critical that is. We know how important the OHL is as a feeder to the NHL and to the AHL and to other um, professional leagues around the world. So we want to do the best we can. Um, and, and I ask you just to be a little bit more patient with us. 
we as we work through these fine points of of the return to play. And I know they're very excited up in the Sioux. I'm, I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing all your uh, your guys up there uh, very very excited about getting back to to uh, to play. Follow up. And. Thinking about the Sioux, um, the Memorial Cup tournament would be happening in Ontario this year if it does happen. Uh, is this still a possibility? Is that another beast to tackle, having the champions of the Western uh, Hockey League and the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League play in Ontario this year? We've not been approached about that at this point in time. Uh, I do know when I was uh, up in the Sioux uh, in the summer, had the great opportunity to meet with the with the um, administration of uh, the Greyhounds, and obviously, uh, there, you know, there was a competition between them and I believe the Oshawa Generals, and so uh, we would want to make sure that if uh, if a cup uh, does, is going to be awarded in Ontario, that uh, this this government is there to support it, and so we were looking at different options there. Uh, but I would say it's too premature. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't have a lot of confidence it would happen um, in in the, this uh, be, be, before um, probably late 2021 or 2022, particularly as it pertains to the spread of COVID-19, the covariance that we've seen, um, and 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 what what level of inoculation we're at. And I think that's really what uh, as as the the minister responsible for the hardest hit sectors and many of whom have not yet been able to open, as you've heard here today, is really eyeing, eyeing uh, how many people are, are inoculated on a day-to-day basis uh, and that helps uh, guide our return and uh, the, the Premier and uh, the Cabinet have asked me to look at those seasonal reopenings and so it's really quite something for us um, to watch and to, uh, to monitor. And last question. Your final question comes from Scott Radley with Hamilton Spectator. Please Hi, go ahead. Hi Scott. Hey Mr. Um, a couple things. I may have missed something and so forgive me if I did but um, at the beginning, we heard there was going to be the money for the youth sports, the, the, the grassroots. We heard there was going to be money for the elite Olympic athletes. And we certainly heard about the OHL. What about other leagues, other minor leagues, uh, taking elite basketball, I think you referenced, or the CPL? or any, Is that still to come? Is that not something that's on the table? Where do they stand? So that's a great question and very important question. So $3.6 million will go to the provincial sport organizations and then that will filter down uh, to some level for the um, the uh, grassroots uh, sports leagues. The other investment I made yesterday, it was a $105 million community building fund. $50 million of that will go to sports and recreation, both for capital and, or, and operating costs. So we will be encouraging uh, those types of leagues to uh, to look at that level of funding to get uh, some support. And of, of course, we do have an upcoming budget and we will have a fall economic statement so as we continue to monitoring the safe uh, and cautious reopening of the Ontario economy which includes sport um, these will be things that we look at uh, in the ministry uh, with our colleagues over at finance and treasury follow up uh, the other thing was follow up about the OHL announcement and uh, you mentioned and I think Dan Ralph was asking about it with the CFL um, or, or the follow-up was it seems like you said there was a first step. This was the first step. I want to be clear. Is there potentially more money if the bubble starts, if the league starts? Is there more money coming in for the OHL to function? I, I'm optimistic that we can provide them some level of uh, financial aid. Um, what that is, I have no idea at this point because we haven't had the return to play protocol signed off and we're not looking at the moment on uh, where they might be playing. So, so the conversation is ongoing with them um, and it's an important dialogue that is continuing. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone.